Herb Lee Jr. has been the executive director of the Pacific American Foundation since January 2005. Uh, the Pacific American Foundation's mission is to help improve the lives of Hawaiians and all Pacific Americans through mentorship and leadership, career planning, development, and employment, research, and community partnerships. Uh, Mr. Lee is a professional musician, songwriter, and recording artist, and is also president of Aloha First International, which focuses on the perpetuation of Hawaiian music, culture, and the arts. In 1995, he's, he uh, founded the Waikalua Loka Fish Pond of Hawaiian uh, Preservation Society, a nonprofit organization to manage and implement a preservation plan. President of Lee Communications Incorporated since 1987, which specializes in community involvement and public participation strategies. Uh, Mr. Lee was a former chief of staff to the Honolulu City Council Chair, Patsy T. Mink, and has been the project manager of the Kahia Loco, Aloha Aina, and Malama Kuhulawe culture-based curriculum development projects funded by the U.S. Department of Education and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs fo focused on ancient fish ponds, the Ahupua's, uh, the land division, and the island of Kahulawe. Uh, born, raised, and educated in Hawaii, Lee graduated from the University of Hawaii at Manoa with a degree in psychology and political science and then a graduate degree in political science. His topic today is integrating traditional knowledge with 21st century education strategies, relevance, rigor, and relationships. Please join me in welcoming Herb Lee, Jr. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, ooh, wow. That's, that sounded really good. I'm very excited to be here, and um, thank, I want to thank uh, the university and uh, uh, all of those that were involved in helping me to uh, arranging this and coming and being able to share. Um, my purpose here is to, is to share and to really kind of uh, share experiences that we've had that works for us in Hawaii, and, uh, and hopefully to plant a seed here in Utah, uh, and maybe you can you know, take this seed and you can add your own knowledge to it, uh, as we say in Hawaiian, malama, to nurture it yourself, add your own mana'o, your own thoughts, your own ideas that are particular to your own community, and make it grow and flourish for yourselves as well. So <clears throat> the focus of my talk is going to be looking at <clears throat> how, we co how do we combine traditional knowledge? What is, it, what is that? And looking at uh, uh, 21st century education, uh, continent performance standards, and I'm sure that you guys are familiar with uh, No Child Left Behind. It's a national initiative uh, that was instituted way back in 2001, and it affects uh, all of the states, including Hawaii, of course, in very profound uh, and unique ways. Some of them uh, positive and some of them not so positive. And so the purpose of my uh, sharing with you today is to Take a look at all those, all those things and maybe how we can come up with maybe a better model to look at that serves the particular needs of the 50,000 Native Hawaiian kids that are part of our public education system in Hawaii. We have about 200,000 students in our public education system. Uh, in the state of Hawaii, uh, we have a centralized education system. It's not run by counties. So um, unfortunately, when we look at the demographics, we look at the statistics about student achievement, um, we find that uh, our Native Hawaiian population are really overrepresented uh, in the, you know, in the non-achievements uh, category. And so um, about two years ago, there was a, about 70 organizations in Hawaii <clears throat> that got together, and we started an initiative called Nao Lao Lama. And so I think I, I uh, have two handouts over here on the, on the table if you don't get it. One is culture-based education. On the top, they're both different, and the other one is indigenous assessment. So if you get a chance, this will give you kind of a, a highlight of some of the, uh, what we term best practices that came out of that conversation over a period of about two years. And what we're trying to do now is to incorporate some of those best practices into a new education model, uh, combining the best of both worlds. And not saying that one is better than the other, but really taking the best of the Western model as well as the traditional model and coming up with something that we feel works better for our learners, for our students. And it's something that uh, has been, um, that has really caught fire here in, uh, in Hawaii and um, people are, have been very interested. So I'm, 
I'm very happy to be able to share a little bit about some of our experiences and uh, also show you some really great pictures of uh, kids um, that uh, are interacting and, and really it's about motivating our kids to be better learners. <clears throat> and you know, we, we, we put forth the value that learning is lifelong. We all know that now. You know, when we were younger, we thought, you know, oh, once we graduate from high school, maybe go to college and that's it. Learning is over, you know. Now we go into the real world, we apply it, we try to get jobs and things like that. But, you know, the world is a, a much different place than it is when even I, when I was growing up. And uh, <clears throat> so we're looking at new ways to really motivate the kids to learn. Uh, statistically, in Hawaii, uh, we have about 30, nearly 30% 30 of our students Native Hawaiian students that are dropping out of high school around the ninth grade <clears throat> because for whatever reason, you know, they don't understand, <clears throat> they, don't, they don't feel that what they're being taught is relevant to their life and, and to uh, looking for opportunities to apply that knowledge. And so, you know, there's all kinds of good reasons, obviously, for us doing this, but basically it focuses on trying to uh, <clears throat> increase student achievement, motivate our kids to learn, and be the best that they can be. That's the bottom line in all of this. So moving on, I just want to kind of go uh, uh, and a little bit tell you about some of our, our Pacific American Foundation, and, uh, and then we'll get right into the, the, the topic. So <clears throat> three things. Worked before. I've got to point it here. <clears throat> Relevance, rigor, and relationships. And uh, I'll, I'll get to these, but if you can kind of keep these three thoughts in your mind, because <clears throat> this is part of the formula for success. Relevance, as I talked about, rigor. <clears throat> A lot of people think that if we do culture-based education that we um, have to deminimize the rigor, but that's not the case at all. We've actually met or exceeded all of the content and performance standards that have been put forth. So rigor is very important. And relationships. Relationships between students, between student and teacher, between students as learners and their family, and their extended family, people in the community that are resource people, either it could be scientists, could be cultural practitioners. Um, um, all of these relationships are very important in terms of uh, a student feeling that they, they have a trust relationship and that the knowledge that is being shared is something that is reciprocal and also that they care about them being good learners and, and accomplishing uh, and being the best that they can be. Very, very, very important. Probably one of the most important things. <clears throat> Pacific American Foundation, uh, as I said, um, uh, is our mission is to improve the lives of Pacific Americans and we serve basically uh, all of the uh, indigenous people of the Pacific region in the, in, the, in the Pacific, in Hawaii, and we also have a reach on the continent of the United States, uh, primarily in the states of, uh, state of Washington, California, Utah, Nevada, and, um, uh, and we have, we have uh, some presence on the East Coast as well in the, in the Washington, D.C. area. These are our five major pathways, uh, as was uh, introduced. Uh, education, mentorship, leadership, training, employment, research, and community partnerships. That's what we kind of focus on. Uh, I want to emphasize the community partnerships part, because as a nonprofit organization, uh, we, <coughs> um, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. There's many other nonprofits out there, and <coughs> there are many. The need is really great, so I spend a lot of time creating uh, partnerships with the private sector, with other nonprofits, with government, uh, and looking for that common mission and that common value to be able to serve uh, our kids better. And most of these organizations that I work with, you know, they are very concerned about education and about investing back in education at younger and younger levels. So it's really cool. <clears throat> A little bit about our... Uh, National Pacific American Leadership Institute, we call it NAPALI. These are for what we call emerging leaders. They're typically late 20s, out of college already, 30s and 40s. Uh, we recruit from throughout the Pacific, Hawaii, and, uh, and the continent, and we, we choose or we select 15 uh, what we call fellows. And we typically have our class once a year in October. 
Victor is one of the uh, graduates of uh, Nepali. And the, the premise of Nepali is to be able to have a conversation with many different leaders, uh, many Pacific Island leaders in Hawaii. Uh, <clears throat> we create a dynamic so that we have a, a mix of people that are coming from different life experiences, different backgrounds. And uh, it's not exclusive to just Pacific Islanders, so if anybody's interested, you can register online. The premise of Nepali is to be able to put forth the idea that <clears throat> in order to survive in today's world, global society, you need to have one foot firmly planted in your culture, whether it be Polynesian or what, Pacific Island, and then one foot firmly planted in the Western culture. And we kind of give you some uh, guidance in terms of how you navigate in today's world using both <clears throat> in your toolbox, so to speak, without giving up one or the other. A lot of people still feel like, you know, to be able to survive in, in the Western world that we have to compromise our Polynesian experiences and our values, and that's not, that's not the case. So, uh, and we have the benefit of sort of mixing it up with uh, kupuna elders that have gone, that have been very successful in government, in education, in health, in business, um, in the military, in, in the religious sector, and to be able to draw on some of their life experiences and to be able to incorporate that. And the idea is when you go back to your communities, then hopefully you will be empowered to, to take your place as a, as a leader in your community and to be part of a ohana or a family network throughout the country and throughout the Pacific to reach out and support each other. <clears throat> so this just kind of reiterates uh, what I just said. So traditional knowledge, what are some of the the uh, words that come to mind uh, when you think about traditional knowledge. Well, these are some of the things that, uh, in talking with people, uh, they have told me. <clears throat> Indigenous, it's native, it's cultural. There's protocols, like the protocol that we did when we came in and entered. There are different beliefs, <clears throat> customs. Ancient wisdom, spiritual, and it's generational. So these are just you know some some ideas, some descriptive words that uh, people have come up with when you when they try to describe what is traditional knowledge. So what is Western? Uh, what is the Western model? Some of the words that come to mind that people have shared is that it's introduced. It's in Hawaii. It's introduced obviously. The first missionaries uh, to Hawaii came in the 1820s, um, and there, you know, the, the, the conversion over to a Western education model occurred probably around the late 1800s after that. <clears throat> it's foreign, it's scientific, it's technical, it's research-based, pragmatic, one size fits all, I love that one, <laughs> superior, institutional. <clears throat> so, I'm gonna show you just a real quick glimpse at the turn of the century, 1900, uh, there were less than 30,000 Hawaiians left. When Captain Cook first came to the islands in the late 1700s, they estimated that there were about maybe a half million to 800,000 Hawaiians that were living throughout the Hawaiian chain. By the 1900s, there were less than 30,000 left. Primarily is because of um, disease <coughs> um, and moving from a subsistence kind of economy to a more uh, market economy, uh, that changed in the 1850s, and, uh, and the population was not ready for it. <clears throat> so this is a, a typical kind of school at, at, in the 1900s, just to kind of show you. So we're looking at trying to combine the best of both worlds in the 21st century, of combining the best of traditional knowledge and the Western model. <clears throat> and basically, this is uh, the three things that we came up with. It's relevant, it's rigorous, and it's built on relationships. <clears throat> so the relevant part is, and I actually have, um, I'm going to pass this around. This, uh, you can kind of look at this. Culture-based and place-based education. Uh, to me, culture-based is, is sort of the overarching uh, philosophy. Place-based is actually utilizing the community as a classroom. So in addition to coming to uh, institutions like this, also, taking advantage of going to places 
Um, and I'll show you some places in Hawaii that we use as sort of a community classroom. We call that place-based education. There's a lot of research going on throughout the country now about the validity of being able to incorporate place-based education as part of mainstream uh, institutional education. So that's things like for in Hawaii, that's going to the ocean, going to the mountain, going to the forest, uh, understanding the interrelationships of the streams as it flows from the mountain to the sea. It's looking at uh, the taro patches, the water flowing to the taro patches, coming out, bringing nutrient-loaded water, coming into the, the back of the fish pond. And looking, looking at wetlands, looking at all of these geophysical features of the islands that's unique to the islands, and being able to incorporate the, the ancient wisdom of how they were able to develop a sustainable ecosystem and aligning that with science, math, social studies, and language arts standards from all grade levels. So with NCLB, with, uh, uh, with the Hawaii Continent Performance Standards, there are specific now benchmarks. Everybody has to teach to standards now, right? Every grade level, you have to hit certain standards in all of the core areas. And we have developed curriculum that meets all of those standards at every grade level and incorporates the traditional knowledge. And it's based on, <coughs> and the purpose of it is to make what they're learning meaningful in their lives. So when they go home, you know, they, they understand that what they do when, when the family goes out fishing or when the family goes out to harvest, you know, taro or banana or whatever it is, that there's a, there's a relationship now and that they, there is a, there's a sense of relevance. So what I'm passing around is, you know, what it looks like, you know, what a, a typical lesson plan looks like and how do we do that. The interesting thing about <coughs> culture-based education is that it's not, um, it's not your typical, you go to a, one class and you learn science, you go to another class and you learn English, you go to another class and you learn math. Culture-based education, if you look at the lesson plans, <coughs> it is integrated. So it is student-driven, so if we're gonna be teaching, say, about fish ponds, it integrates <coughs> the science, math, you know, social studies, all of the core standards together. So you're learning all of these things simultaneously instead of you know, being in, in different boxes. So that's the, the relevant part. The rigorous part, you know, we, have, we're, <coughs> we have evolved what we call indigenous assessments, uh, using the best of the research methodology and evaluations, and coming up with our own holistic evaluation. So it's not just based on GPA or SAT scores or ACT scores. We're looking at the learner as a whole, and we're looking at um, all the different ways that, that he or she learns that includes interviews, talking with teachers, parents, peers, uh, coaches, and see you know, how their, their maturation, how their growth process is, is coming. We also have a very inter interesting way to assess uh, if they really got it. And we call it hoike. It's a way for them to demonstrate in the front of their peers or masters to see if they really got it. So if I'm gonna teach uh, <coughs> the science of wall building, how, how are we gonna how do we mathematically build this wall to be, to be able to allow thousands and thousands of gallons of water into, this, into the pond, <clears throat> looking at the, the tides and the moon and the stars and all that kind of stuff, how do you do that? So we get to a point where, where, we, where they've been taught something like this and then now they have to demonstrate to us <clears throat> in a hoike format, how do you actually do that and show us? It basically means to show. And so that's part of the rigorous and the relationships I talked a little bit about. It also empowers learners to be resilient. It has enhanced their self-identity, their self-esteem, because once they get motivated to learn and once they understand that the knowledge that they're learning is relevant to their own situation, you know, that is huge in terms of that self-identity, that self-esteem, and probably more importantly, the efficacy part, knowing that I can, I can do this. I can do this higher order thinking. I can do this higher order, uh, you know, I can come up with my own hypothesis and I can figure out why it works or why it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, I'm gonna try again, right? So that is huge. That's a resilient factor. And that is important because a lot of our kids are coming from families that are maybe single parent or they're living with grandparents and they don't have somebody home that's always supporting them and being the best advocates for their education. So, you know, we have all of these other external factors that begin to uh, <coughs> impact, you know, uh, a student's uh, ability to learn. 
And so this, this resilient part is very important. And probably the final and most important thing, that once we get them to the point where they take responsibility for their own learning, then you know you got it. That's, that's, the, that's the point. Then we take them and then we do all these other things uh, in terms of help, helping them with getting into colleges or technical education or vocational training, sports or whatever, and uh, being able to hook them up with careers and uh, scholarships and whatever, whatever, whatever else it takes to get them to that next level. It's really amazing. <coughs> so <coughs> this is uh, basically reiterating my definition of culture-based education. It's aligned to standards, it's place-based, oops, sorry. It's uh, using uh, experiential kind of an effort, and it's student-driven, yeah? Normally in the, in the public education system, you walk into the classroom, especially in the elementary school, right? Teachers, I mean, I love teachers. I have the highest respect for teachers. We spend a lot of time <coughs> in the classrooms, and, uh, <coughs> you know, sometimes 60% of their time is just trying to discipline kids, you know? Um, and they never get to actually the learning part, you know? Um, and it's, it's difficult because kids come to school with all kinds of things that are going on in their lives that are really not part of the, you know, the, the learning environment. So that part is very important. So, and, and we also know now that you know, human beings have multiple types of intelligences. Everybody is not the same. It's not one size fits all anymore. Some people are visual learners. Some people are more tactile learners. Some people are more kinesthetic learners. Some people are more hands-on. That's what kinesthetic means. Some people can, you know, memorize and, and, and read books and get, get it like that. Some don't. <clears throat> and we find that a lot of our Polynesian students are really visual learners and they're tactile learners. So we try to design curriculum and experiences so that it takes advantage of their innate gifts and talents and really tries to nurture that to the highest uh, degree possible. So if you can imagine that if you're, if you're this kind of learner and you're brilliant, uh, in terms of uh, music or things like that, and you're in a situation, a lot of our schools have dropped music and dropped art because they've doubled up on reading, mathematics, and, and, um, and science, because that's, that's what they're being tested on. And the schools are not meeting the minimum standards for, for that. So they're, they're doing that you know, triple time every day, and they cut out all of the other stuff. Even physical education they've cut out in some schools. So can you imagine, if you're this kind of a learner and you're going through this kind of experience, by the time you go through a number of years, you're like, I can't take this anymore, right? I can't take this anymore, I'm out. And here is a parent going, you know, what's going on? What are you guys doing to my student? You guys, you know, the, the education system has not adequately addressed the needs of kids. And so it has to be student driven. We have to look for solutions that are look are looking at the unique um, uh, challenges that students are facing now. <clears throat> so really quickly, uh, focus on the student. We're looking at a context. There's a model in here in the culture-based um, handout that I have that kind of puts this into a graphic. It's about context, meaning you know going out to the to the community classroom. It's about content that that includes knowledge, that includes language, values. And spirituality, <clears throat> for our Polynesian people, for our Hawaiian people, that mana, that spiritual understanding of mind, body, and spirit being in alignment is absolutely essential to the learning process. And you know, in the public education system, you know, they try to extricate the spiritual part and cannot, we say, you know, aole, cannot. Um, so, so what is culture? It's, a, it's basically, it's not just Hawaiian culture, it's not just Samoan, Tongan, Fijian, whatever. It's a collective experience of a group of people. So, as I said before, when we're planning a scene, you know, understand what your cultural context is, what works for you and your students and your community, and try to capitalize on the, on the wonderful uniqueness about your own culture, and celebrate that, and incorporate that into the teaching. Glitch. Hey, you think it was that little? Okay. Oh, 
I touch something? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. <coughs> values. Uh, what are values? This is just kind of reiterating what I just spoke about. You know, everybody is different. Everybody's unique. <clears throat> so in Hawaiian, the basic building blocks of learning for us is a combination of Bye Bye, EK, and Noel. Can you, uh, uh, are you guys? It's for the recording. Okay, so I should stay here then. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so which translates to values, knowledge, and skills. These are our building blocks. This, uh, this term in Hawaiian, a'o, is a very interesting term, and it kind of reiterates what I've been saying in terms of the reciprocal responsibility of learning. <clears throat> a'o in Hawaiian means to teach as well as to learn. So a student <clears throat> and a teacher have a reciprocal responsibility. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> a lot of the teachers that we train don't know nothing about, say, fish ponds, okay? Hawaiian-based fish ponds. But um, Kalani has grown up on the fish pond all his life. He's in the ninth grade now, and now his science teacher wants to use our curriculum, and he wants, they want to teach all his classmates about science in the local fish pond in his community, right? So now the class goes down there. Who becomes the teacher? It's Kalani, he, right? He has the knowledge. So that's that, that's that concept of a'o. Now the teacher becomes the student, right? And that dynamic, that relationship is very, very powerful. And to understand that as we go through life <clears throat> and we adopt the, the idea that we are lifelong learning, that we have to be humble enough to know that sometimes we have to be in that ha'a ha'a role or that humble role, you know? And we have to be open to ideas even if it comes from somebody that's way younger than you, right? And what we have found is that that really gives, you know, we talk about self-identity and self-esteem for, for Kalani. All of a sudden, his classmates see him as something that they never saw him before as. He becomes that leader. He becomes that, that model. And this is something that is just like second nature to him, no big thing, right? But it is very powerful dynamic. And that, that concept is very, very critical. <clears throat> Inquiry. You know, <clears throat> these are, we're talking about the same things when we, when we look at trial and error. And I like to use, um, you know, in, in forming hypotheses, we go through all of these things, right? Risk taking, extrapolating, you know, looking at data and things like that. And I always use the example of wayfinding. Wayfinding is a, is a method uh, that was used for the earliest of voyagers, Polynesian voyagers. So <clears throat> we know now historically that the Hawaiian Islands were discovered by these voyagers 1,500 years ago using no instruments except the stars, the moons, the winds, the currents, the fish, the birds, looking at all of these things as clues to determine where they were going. And we call that wayfinding today. Uh, and it's, it was a lot of trial and error. People say that there were generations of Hawaii Loa who was the first explorer, Polynesian explorer, to discover the Hawaiian Islands 1,500 years ago. How did they do this? In our generation in 1975, <clears throat> we have some young Hawaiians that took up that mantle. They formed the Polynesian Voyaging Society, and they proved that they could sail without any instruments back and forth from Hawaii to Polynesia on traditional voyaging canoes. So uh, these, you know, this kind of rigor, this kind of inquiry has always been there. All we have to do is connect the dots and connect it to the best of the tradition and the best of the Western. And, you know, for many years people said, people discounted that they could even do that. There's no way that they could do that. And now we know, you know, that uh, that is, that's, that's true. So we're going to talk a little bit about fish ponds now. Fish ponds... In Hawaiian history, um, there were probably about 500 fish ponds that were built throughout the state of Hawaii, uh, well, before we, we, we were a state, uh, in ancient times. And fish ponds, it's like, you know, just going out into the forest and picking bananas and, and taro or things like that and going out into the open ocean and fishing versus actually being able to farm, you know, uh, fruits, vegetables, and fish. 
and being able to understand after many years of observation how to design a system that would, would be able to sustain themselves and they would be able to fish farm and not just go out into the open ocean. Sometimes you catch, sometimes you don't, depending on the weather and all that kind of stuff. And if you had 10,000 people you know, back on land and your responsibility every day as a fisherman, uh, um, as a Levite, they call it, to go out and fish for the 10,000 people every day and you come back and you don't have enough, you know, it doesn't work out too good. So the transition to uh, fish pond uh, mariculture uh, going back 800 years was huge in terms of the perpetuation of the culture and the race. And we know now uh, that uh, the, the, the population just kind of spiked up as these fish ponds were developed. The type of fish pond that I'm going to be showing you is, uh, is a fish pond that um, has not been duplicated anywhere else in the world. Uh, it's, a, it's a fish pond that is, that's built right on the shores of the ocean, and it brings in fresh water from the mountain, and there's a zone of mixture in the pond, which we call brackish or vaikai. Uh, brackish water, a little, a little fresh and a little salt. And the chiefs wanted these conditions because they felt that the fish that were grown in these fish ponds were the best tasting. And, uh, <clears throat> and in our lifetime right now, these fish ponds are basically on the verge of vanishing. They haven't been taken care of for about 150 years. <clears throat> and we're in the process of restoring them, not necessarily for the short term to raise fish, but to be able to use these ponds as a place to nurture knowledge for these students. And that's, this is one of the contextual things that we're using in our culture-based curriculum. So going back, you know, <clears throat> this is uh, Diamond Head over here. Uh, let's see if I can point this right there. <laughs> and this, in 1825, when the British explorers were still coming here, you know, Waikiki used to be basically all underwater. It was all fish ponds. And of course, if, if any of you have been to Waikiki now, they're Ponds are gone. Yeah. <clears throat> so the Ahupua, we've also developed curriculum for the Ahupua. So we started with fish ponds. Ahupua is a land division that extends from the mountain to the sea. And all of the geophysical conditions, all of the geo geophysical features of Ahupua, we have developed curriculum for. So as I talked about, the wetlands, the streams, the oceans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so this is a typical Ahupua a map. Uh, our fish pond is located right here in the Ahupua of Kaneohe. These are the mountain ranges right here. And the water, it rains on the mountain ranges and the waters flow down to the ocean over here. <clears throat> this is Kaneohe Bay today. Uh, and our pond is right there. You can see it right there. So we have a <laughs> unique opportunity right in the middle of an urban area now. Uh, to be able to, and we have thousands of kids that are coming down to our pond now, you know, learning the curriculum, and we've trained over a thousand teachers over the last five years, and so they're coming <laughs> not just from our community, but f from all over the islands uh, and and from the east coast and from all over the place because they want to learn, you know, what what is this thing going on? We also have in the middle of Kaneohe Bay this island over here that's owned by the University of Hawaii for the very first time. It is known as the Hawaii uh, Institute of Marine Biology. It is one of the premier uh, research facilities in the Pacific for uh, marine uh, research. And so we have a wonderful partnership with them and with the colleges in our area. And uh, so we, we mix it, you know, the, their scientists are our mentors for our kids and our teachers and all of the cultural practitioners. So they're getting really high level uh, stuff. <clears throat> The name of our pond is Waikalua Loco, which means two waters. And this is where it is right here. <clears throat> Somebody had this idea to build a sewage treatment plant right there, which actually has been decommissioned for about 20 years. And we're hoping, we're in the process of trying to acquire this. We don't own it, but we have an agreement. It's gone through four different ownerships. We're trying to acquire all this and maybe turn this into a, an aquacultural research facility that will complement what we're doing for the restoration of the pond. <clears throat> so lots of issues to study, to think about, to hypothesize about, to um, contrast historically, you know, in the future. Great, great, great classroom. And this is what it looks like standing on the wall. 
And I'm just going to go through these, these really quickly because I want to get to some maybe, maybe question and answers. This is our first generation curriculum that was uh, developed uh, in the year 2000 to 2003. And these you know, represent all the things that I talked about. These are just pictures of kids coming down and learning science and uh, social studies, language arts, and having a great time. These are teachers uh, that are coming for their training sessions, <clears throat> and they come from all over. So it's not just focused on Hawaiian kids. It's, you know, when we put out the call for teacher training workshops, they come from all over. And um, we, all, we always get filled up really, really quickly. This is just, um, there's a lot of invasive. In Hawaii, we have the most invasive species ever, any place on the planet. We also have the most native amount of plants in the sea and on, the, and, and, and on land as well. So what they're doing here is taking out invasive seaweed that has basically choked out all of the native uh, seaweed, and we're using technology. This is called, we call this our beloved super sucker. <laughs> <coughs> it's, a, it's a small version of a super sucker. It's basically an underwater vacuum cleaner. The kids will go into the water and just kind of make piles of all of the invasive stuff, and then we come with this hose and we just suck it up and put it into a, a, a raft or thing, take it on the shoreline, we deposit it, and then what happens is that the taro farmers will take the seaweed and put it into their taro fields up in the farm because high nitrogen, that's what they love. I've used it as fertilizer on my grass, just taking, you know, washing out, take the salt out, throw it on the grass, lawnmower it, mulch it, and instant free nitrogen fix. <laughs> We do all kinds of things. This is one of our kids uh, that started with us that has become, he just started college this year, and he's teaching the teachers now about the life cycle of the pond and the biology. And he, his, uh, um, his dream is to become a marine biologist. This is what the wall looks like. This is the ocean here, Kaneohe Bay, and this is the pond. And if you can kind of notice, the tide is coming up, so the water's are coming into the pond. We have three water passageways that basically empty the water from the pond every day, two times a day. Natural conditions. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, the name of our um, ahupua a curriculum, you know, the, the one from the mountain to the sea that has all of the other components. <clears throat> and these are just some activities that they do where Rebuilding, the, the, the wall was originally 1,400 feet long. It's about 12 acres in size, this pond. And it's relatively small by Hawaiian fish pond standards. Uh, the largest was 500 acres in size. I mean, these, we're talking about huge fish ponds. Um, and they were typically, we could harvest, we could propagate maybe about 2,000 pounds of fish per acre. <clears throat> and the fish are like, you know, they were herbivores, so you didn't have to feed the fish. You know, all we had to do is figure out how to grow uh, seaweed in the pond, and basically seaweed needs sunlight, so the water cannot be too deep so that the sunlight cannot penetrate. So, and it's brackish water, so the, the typical water depth of the pond is about 30 to 36 inches. The seaweed grows nuts, and of course, you know, it feeds all of the thousand pounds of, thousands of pounds of fish. <coughs> This is an activity that doesn't, get, uh, doesn't happen too often, but it's a very traditional way. We lay out a net. How, how do we catch fish ponds in the fish pond? There's a lot of different ways, but one of the fun ways is to lay out a net. It's about maybe two or 300 feet long. And then you make a human line, and you get sticks, and you pound the water. And all they have to do is keep the line straight, and then they chase the fish into the, into the fish net. Now, the fish are very, very smart. So if there's any gaps between people, they go right through them, right? They, they're trying to run away. So it's, it's really fun. And they get to uh, do this, and then they have to uh, pull the net <coughs> out of uh, the pond, and they have to identify the species. And uh, it's, it's, really, it's really great. So we call this makahana kaike, the knowledge is in the doing. Very simple concept, but very profound, very profound. <laughs> they're actually... You know, over here, what they have to do is they, as, a, as a fish comes out, they put them into buckets, and then this part of the, of the fish line, of the net is a part that they have to clean because there's all limu and stuff, so this is the part that they have to take out the stuff and throw the thing back in the pond. 
because a net has to come out clean. Otherwise, you've got to do it over again. <clears throat> we also have done a, a thing called phytoremediation. Uh, this is utilizing a native plant. This is called a, a kuli kuli that grows at the pond. And we've been experimenting with ways to clean up the water of the pond because, as you saw, we're in the middle of an urban area. There's a lot of runoff. There's a lot of heavy metals. There's a lot of chemicals from ground termite medicine that has percolated in the ground over the years, things like that. So we've been looking at a way to f basically come up with a way to clean the water. And uh, one of the scientists came up with this idea to use phytoremediation, using plants to basically clean up the water. And what happens is that they'll plug this plant on this little raft over here that they put it on the water. The green part is sticking up so they can have the sunlight. And then what happens is that the roots will grow down about three or four feet. And the roots will absorb uh, the water and some of the, the different types of chemicals in the water. And then, <clears throat> then you, after a period of time, then you remove, the, you remove the vegetation and you dispose of it. So it works. It takes a little bit, uh, a, a long time maybe a couple of years, but it works, and it's a natural way instead of using any kind of chemicals to clean up chemicals. Uh, so, and these are things that they're learning, and they're hypothesizing and experimenting. Uh, these are rock, rock wall building. We've also developed mentorship programs because, as I said, a lot of our kids, you know, don't have that really one stable, you know, adult in their life, and we've used all of these stewardship uh, opportunities to mentor kids as well and it's been very successful. So there's been a lot of spin-off programs that we've developed as well. We have fun. Again, they're laying the line. That's me right there. <laughs> and rigor. We bring down all of the microscopes, everything. We bring the classroom down to the fish pond, basically. All the water testing kits, all of the ex experimental stuff. And they just do it right there. And it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, they, they make the connected dots like that, you know, because it's real, right? <clears throat> These are just some other mentoring uh, uh, things that we do. And, of course, the reward is if they, if they do well with their studies, then we allow them to go catch fish. <laughs> That's the reward. They don't... Can you imagine you're, you're going to the fish pond for nine months and you cannot catch fish? You've got to learn. And then when you learn, then you can catch fish. You know? So it's like, uh, we, we're not stupid. You know? Got to use a little bit of incentive to get everybody going. You know? Keep them coming back. Yeah. You know, and these, these are Molokai kids. It's really interesting. The, the kids that are raised in the country versus the kids that are raised in the, in the city night and day. If we ever had, you know, I mean, God forbid, but if we ever had any kind of catastrophe, I would go with the rural kids because I would live and I would survive. <laughs> These guys know how to do that. <clears throat> uh, one of the other great things that we've done is the kids get excited. They go home. They tell their parents. They tell their grandparents. So what we did was we designed these community work days so that the kids can bring their, their ohana, their, their family, extended, their friends, and they come and they, they, they see what are they all excited about. And then, so this is an opportunity to, again, build relationships with family and friends. And they come and they, they malama, they care. They learn side by side with the kids. And again, the, the kids become the learner. And it's just a nice cycle that just is very supportive and reinforcing. They get to meet all of us. We get to meet them. And uh, it's, when we first started this in 1995, when we had these community work days, we had like five people, ten people show up. Now, we're, you know, we're trying to restore a 13-acre fish pond that has been basically, you know, not maintained for 150 years. So there's a lot of work to be done. And now <clears throat> we have, these are Molokai kids. They wanted me to put this in there. <laughs> <clears throat> so I said I would. <clears throat> um, oh. Um, and we've also incorporated, you know, the, the, the community businesses, the civic clubs, um, organizations. They all now have kind of jumped on, and they all come and they all help now. So it really becomes a community building thing, you know. Um, so building strong individuals, empowering individuals, empowers communities. That's the, that's the bottom line. So these are just some college students. <clears throat> so it's... Businesses, I'm going to go through this really quick. And 
This is what our community work days look like now. We have like two, three hundred people come out for four hours and they work hard side by side. And it's amazing when you have many hands working on a project together and what you can accomplish in a short time. And people are just amazed. Wow, we built that in four hours? You know, it's so, it's so reinforcing. So now everybody writes us up as, oh, we're learning science at the fish pond now. You know, this is like the place to be. And uh, now it's a learning center. And, you know, be, you know, 15 years ago it was like rubbish. You know, it's, they built sewage treatment plants next to it and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, now it's like, we got to protect the fish pond at all costs, you know. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so what are the tenets of success? <clears throat> Uh, these are just, you know, some really quick things, uh, relevance, all the things that I talked about, and uh, it's been really great. So what did we learn? All knowledge is not learned in one school. This is a, a Hawaiian saying by one of our uh, revered elders, Mary Kavena Pukui, Aohe Pau Kaike, Ika Halau Ho'okahi. And she also uh, has other mana'o to share. And this one is really great <clears throat> because really learning is about making mistakes sometimes, yeah? And wisdom is a sum total of knowledge and experience, and there are many things that cannot be learned except through trial and error. So you have to do, right, in order to learn. <clears throat> the other thing, another one that I like is, and unfortunately this, the canoe, there's supposed to be a canoe and a harbor right there. And the canoe was not made to sail in the harbor. You know, that means that the student, you know, needs to have an opportunity to spread their wings. They can't just be in the harbor and we can't be protecting them, and we can't be just, you know, focusing them on a box all the time. They need to be able to have the knowledge and go out and, and sail. Um, and that's what that Olelo Noel means. And finally, <clears throat> we are all connected. Uh, these are our experiences. I hope that this has been able to kind of plant a seed for you folks, and hopefully that you folks can nurture that in your own community. And so I challenge you guys to define metaphorically what is in your pond. And how can you empower your community through the knowledge that you are gaining in this experience here at the university? How are you going to give back to your people, <clears throat> to your families, to your communities? And uh, anything that I can do to help, I'd be happy to, to do that. And uh, so I just want to say uh, mahalo and thank you for your time. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Raise your hand and we'll bring the mic because we're podcasting and video recording. And tell us your name and your major so we know who you are. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Jeremy Meek. I am a sociocultural anthropology major. Um, the question I have actually, it's, I, I, I see that, you know, you've, you've kind of um, redefined um, what the education model would be for your own community. And we see that, you know, in traditional Western models of education, it's kind of based off of this notion of competition, which is supposed to fil facilitate, you know, the proper skills and abilities for a workplace where competition is equally uh, integral. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like what you're doing here is um, learning is based more off of kind of a communal aspect um, where students aren't competing, that co competition isn't the integral part, it's cooperation. That's what it, that's kind of the impression that I've, I've gotten from your presentation. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, how are these students when they're, uh, you know, you mentioned that it, they, they go on to get careers and stuff, so it still sounds like it's, it's career oriented. Yes. Um, how are the students adjusting after they go through this education process, which is, you know, cooperative and all that stuff? Um, how, how are they adjusting to this market environment where, you know, that may not be valued or looked upon as much? That's a good question. Um, I, you know, we're, <clears throat> we're not trying to eliminate competition, but at the same time, in the traditional Western model, it's not all about competition. It's about learning, and it's about uh, empowering our kids to be the best learners that they can. So, um, you know, it's, we, we are in the process of, uh, it's only been probably less than 10 years that, um, that we've been able to sort of track. So it really has been, a, to me, a very short term. What we're looking at is to try to look for one cohort to be able to study from, from the K to 12 
and then that transition, all immersed in this, this culture-based education model. Right now what it is is that maybe they'll try the model out for maybe a quarter and then they'll go back to the old way. So it's really hard to, we've been able to assess within, in the time that they do it that there is a 15 to 20 percent increase in student achievement. But we need to uh, obviously apply more rigorous and longitudinal type of methodology and evaluation and assessment to look at it you know, in a more hol holistic way. So the, the short answer to you is that we haven't eliminated competition, but it's not a priority. Uh, it's it's student driven and it's it's you know trying to focus on the needs of the student and but what we are seeing is that uh, we are seeing a more high incidence of the of the kids that we've been exposed to and have an opportunity to work with that are uh, doing well in college and getting into college um, so that's a that's a good preliminary indicator for us that's driving us to keep doing this so good question and we, you know, we know that we have to look at things more longitudinally as well and really you know, look at the data and really assess it uh, at a much deeper level. But you know, we've had some discussion about the competition thing, thing uh, as well. And um, you know, if you're in that environment solely and you're, you don't have some of the other stuff, then you get left behind. Because if that's not the, the way you learn, if you're in an environment and you don't learn well that way and it's all based on competition and grades. Now I went to a private school as well and everything was grades. Grades, 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 grades. That's what, that's what we did every day, competed for grades because we want to go to the next level, yeah. And uh, it worked for me, uh, but you know, I had no, I didn't learn my, you know, we lived in a generation yeah. where the culture was suppressed, yeah. Uh, but now that, <clears throat> you know, we're looking at the current statistics of kids, you know, now that we know better, and we can maybe offer a, another model. Yes. I have kind of like a two-phase question. Number one, uh, how is your curriculum being accepted by the general education system here in the United States? And number two, like you mentioned at the end, is we're all connected. Right. What are the possibilities of this being accepted, for example, inner cities? because they have their own culture and learning different styles and obviously I believe they could benefit from the same system and are there any future plans or possibilities for that? Well, the short answer is that's why I'm here, uh, to plant the seed, yeah, and make people aware that there's an alternative. Um, it hasn't been accepted nationally yet, but we have gotten, uh, for my two projects on the fish pond and the ahupua, we have gotten uh, a major award from the Hawaii Department of Education as one of the new um, uh, models for, for, for education in Hawaii. Um, the, under the federal government, uh, there's a council called the Native Hawaiian Education Council that where we got the funding, federal funding to do this. They selected our curriculum as a new model for culture-based education. It's online that you can take a look at. Uh, I'll be happy to give you the URL for that if you want to take a look at it. And uh, so, you know, we are making those strides. And uh, quite frankly, we are trying to make a paradigm shift, right? And it's going to, but it's not going to be, you know, instant. It's going to, it's going to take a long time and we have to do more study. We have to do more work and we have to reach more people. And not everybody, not all of the administrators in the Hawaii system have really jumped on board. So what we've done is worked with the complex superintendents and the principals and the teachers that are open to this idea and have incorporated it and are, and are continuing to incorporate it and sending more teachers. And so, you know, I believe in one small success creates another success creates another success. And hopefully over the next 10 years this will be, instead of the exception, hopefully this will be the rule. Yes. Not, uh, not specifically with uh, PCC, uh, but we have a, a lot of partnerships with uh, Polynesian, other Polynesian organizations that are primarily focused on um, um, education. Uh, there's, not, there's not many of them around. We're one of the few. We partner with um, the Polynesian Voyaging Society, of course, and with uh, the, the uh, Proteco Olave Ohana, because we're doing a major curriculum on the island of Koho Olave as well and with the Koalavi Island Reserve Commission. And there's never been, this is one of the first times that all of those organizations have kind of come together to do a joint project like this. 
And it's because people feel strongly about education and about being able to tell the story correctly and really not just only tell the story but empower our students to be the next stewards and to take our place someday and carry on, you know, the, 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 the tradition and the knowledge as well. And then the follow-up question. Yeah. Microphone. Do, you, do you agree with the uh, Hawaiian royal patrons? Brackish water produced the best tasting fish. It's one of those things that's beauty in the eye of the beholder because a lot of the nearshore fisheries in Hawaii are basically fished out. We're at the point where if you catch fish, I don't care if it came from brackish water or seawater, I'm eating it. <laughs> as long as it's not polluted, you know. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, it, it's a different thing. We hope that someday we can restore a lot of the fish ponds. There's only maybe about 60 of them left out of the 500 to be able to restock the near shore, near shore fisheries, you know, in, in, the, in, the, the, in Hawaii, Hawaiian waters because we're basically fished out, which is unbelievable. There's a lot of invasive stuff that has come in that has ruined the coral reefs, and we got all kinds of invasive uh, fish and stuff, and and it's just it's not a good situation. So you know we're looking to hopefully cultivate you know a new generation of uh, marine biologists and scientists that are really uh, passionate about this 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 issue. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'll be happy to talk, uh, answer any questions afterwards, but they want me to play a, a song, so is that okay? I'm going to do this song called Hawaii Aloha, which uh, was uh, written by a reverend, and he wrote it right around the turn of the century, 1900, because he were, you know, as I said, people were very concerned about uh, the perpetuation of the people and the culture and the race, and uh, this song talks about Hawaii Aloha means beloved Hawaii, and it talks about the sands of my birth, and it also talks about opio, which are the children, and, and really paying attention to the children because they're going to be the next ones to carry on. And we need to pray for them. Uh, we need to pray that um, they have uh, more opportunities than we had. <laughs> 